If there is one issue which is used to discredit and stain Hinduism, it is caste. Critics are quick to throw out all the ancient wisdom of the tradition. They are content to disregard the teachings of great masters and write off Sanadana Dharma as an evil social enterprise which discriminates whole sections of society. It also means that certain people are born uh, to a certain level of life and certain people are born to another level of life and that is justified. And that means the caste system. Uh, the caste system and that means over a third of India's population of a billion are regarded as communicable social diseases such that if I was a low caste person and my shadow felt on you, you would have to go and ritually wash yourself in order to continue to take part in society. One cannot deny the existence and indeed the horrific history of caste discrimination. Dalits or untouchables in particular have suffered terribly. They have been denied basic human rights and subjected to the worst prejudice. Consequently, they have been crippled by the vile mindset of others in their society. The question that is most relevant to Hinduism is how much does caste have to do with religion and how much of it is simply a product of centuries of social development. This is a hotly debated issue, with scholars on both sides putting forward their case. The important thing is that Hindus approach the issue of caste carefully and with as much honesty as possible. The first thing to do is define the terms correctly. The word caste is a foreign imposition and is a blanket term that is used to describe two distinct ideas, that of Varna and Jati. So let's take Varna first. The word essentially means colour and the concept of Varna is found throughout Hindu scripture. It is first introduced in the Rig Veda in the Purusha Sukta hymn. The great Purusha or Divine Personality is described as having the Brahmin class who forms the head. These are the people dedicated to God and responsible for the upkeep of tradition and ritual. The Kshatriyas come from the arms. They are the rulers in charge of governance and defence of society. The Vaishyas come from the thighs and are responsible for trade and economy, while the Shudras are born from the feet and are the servants or labourers of society. Some have argued that the feet have a lower status than the head, but as some scholars have suggested, the Purusha has always been envisaged lying down, in the same way that every part of the body works to serve the whole, every class is designed to work for the benefit of society as a whole. The underlying principle is that everybody is equal since every individual has a divine self or Atman, but at the same time, not everybody is the same. We all have different abilities and different temperaments which are suited for different tasks. Not everyone has the qualities to be a Brahmin surrendered to God. Not everyone should be allowed to be a leader and rule. There are some who are hardwired to step out and start business ventures and there are others who are content to have a simple life of work. These divisions of society are seen to be in tune with the natural tendencies of people and when the Varanas fail to work in a complementary way, injustice and chaos results. If we look at things today on a global level, we can see we do not have a recognisable Brahmin class who lives selflessly for the welfare of everyone. The Kshatriyas, who are the governments, are therefore not guided and as a result, instead of leading the Vaishyas, we find that it is the Vaishyas, the corporations and banks who dictate policy. Consequently, the Shudras, who are the hard-working individuals, suffer trying to make an honest living. The Indian Varna system was not unique to India. In ancient times, societies around the world were also organised into similar social divisions. We have to remember, these were agricultural civilizations with far fewer options for work and career. There was no central education system where individuals studied for 18 years before figuring out what to do. There was no welfare state. Children were the economic assets who had to learn the trade of their family as quickly as possible. As a result, it was of paramount importance to maintain these classes to ensure the success of a nation. The only difference was, in India, it was codified. The insistence on the dharma or duty of each varna is repeatedly stressed in scripture. If people in the different classes start to forget their role, then inevitably the whole setup begins to crumble. If Brahmins start becoming business minded, if warriors started to renounce warfare, if merchants started giving up their trade, and if servants stopped working, the very survival of the people would be at stake. 
It is from this angle that Krishna in the Gita argues his point. Krishna talks about Loka Sangraha, the welfare of the world that we all have to strive for. He repeatedly puts forward the notion of Karma Yoga, that we do the Dharma that has been assigned to us without attachment for the greater good of all. He teaches that whether we are a Brahmin or a Shudra, we shouldn't shirk our duty, but rather perform it selflessly as an offering to God. That way, whoever we are, whatever place we are in within society, we will attain the Supreme. But the crucial question that is always asked is, is the Varna system based on birth or on the qualities we display? In the Gita, Krishna states, According to qualities and the work ascribed to them, the four divisions of human society were created by me. Many interpret this verse to mean Varna is based purely on qualities and not birth. But, a careful reading of the Gita as a whole suggests that the verse is less about how people enter the Varna system, but rather about how each Varna is distinct from the other because of the work and qualities ascribed to them. If we read further in chapter 18, Krishna outlines the qualities of each Varna and then makes it clear that these qualities are a reflection of the inherent nature or Svabhava that the individual has been born with. The suggestion the Gita makes is that the karma from previous lives creates one's inherent nature. This nature contains certain qualities. These qualities then decide the dharma or purpose one will have for the next life. The varna one is born into provides the context for this purpose to be lived out. So Krishna effectively explains that both birth and one's qualities together decide which class one belongs to. It is obvious that not everyone born to a Brahmin family will display Brahmin qualities. But the essential point Krishna makes is that our birth is not an accident. The circumstances in which we are born into are reflective and specifically designed so that we can carry out our dharma or purpose in this life. The question of what dharma means practically is up for debate. Krishna ties in dharma with social class which makes sense if we understand how ancient civilizations worked. The Gita calls for a stable society where individuals work selflessly for the welfare of the world. It is also a dialogue stressing the need for Arjuna to fulfil his duty as a Kshatriya. The Mahabharata, however, has various views on the matter. Different characters come forward and express their own idea of what Dharma is. Yudhisthira, who is seen as the embodiment of righteous behaviour, is highly critical of the idea that Varna should be decided by birth alone. He states, If the designated qualities of a Shudra are not found in a Shudra, then he is not a Shudra. And if the designated qualities of a Brahmin are not found in a Brahmin, then he is not a Brahmin. A person is known to be a Brahmin only when the appropriate mode of life is witnessed. In fact, this point is expressed and shown throughout the epics and Puranas. The whole character of Karna in the Mahabharata demonstrates this point. He is born a Kshatriya and displays every noble quality of a warrior. But because he was abandoned and adopted by Shudras, his biological parents were unknown. Consequently, he is refused the same treatment and rank as other warriors. Vyasa, the author of the Mahabharata, shows the reader the terrible injustice of judging someone based on their birth alone. If we look at Valmiki, he begins as a highway robber, but then, through the blessings of sages, he becomes a great Brahmin who records the Ramayana. Vishwamitra was another warrior who through many trials eventually reached a state of mastery where he was made a great Rishi. If we turn to the Bhagavatam, we read again the same sentiment expressed by sage Narada. He states, if one shows the qualities of being a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya or Shudra, even if he has appeared in a different class, he should be accepted based on the qualities he has shown. Repeatedly we see how the Varna system is valued, but also how birth should not be the determining factor in deciding someone's class. However, one cannot deny that the overemphasis on birth over qualities is regrettably apparent in some Hindu scriptures. The Dharma Shastras, specifically the Manushmriti, has a number of hostile verses which judge and propose abominable treatment against so-called outcasts. It states about them, They must dress in the clothes left by persons who have died. 
eat only from broken dishes, wear ornaments of black iron and must move from place to place, a man intent on dharma must have no contact with them. Some may argue that such ideas were justifiable in the context of their time. Ritual purity and the Vedic Yagna was given paramount importance and to mix with people who lived by unclean professions was seen as contamination. The defence only holds so far and there is evidently a degree of contempt in these verses for those of a lower class. But it goes without saying that most Hindus would happily condemn such verses. The Dharma Shastras are just one group of innumerable texts. Hindus do not rely on them to tell them what to do. They are unlikely to even know about the existence of the Manushmriti, let alone base their life on it. The modern day situation in India is difficult to pin down. Instead of the set varna system described in different scriptures, we have Jati. Jatis are different social groups of which there are thousands. How the Jatis work often depends on the region, with most linked to a job or trade. The Jati groups are said to have emerged centuries ago in a loose way from the ancient Varna system. The groups nowadays however are not only Hindu, there are Christian and Muslim ones too, demonstrating that Jati today is much more of a living cultural phenomena rather than a religious one. Where there has been a lack of social security, the Jatis have provided economic and community support to their members. While there may have been hierarchical distinctions, they were not necessarily fixed. As economic and environmental conditions changed, Jatis either gained or lost status. Individuals too were not necessarily shackled to one Jati. There was a degree of fluid movement between the different groups. The British colonial rule however further cemented and exacerbated the now caste system. The census that was carried out by them forcibly fixed the different groups in line with the Varna system. Despite many Jatis no longer fitting into the ancient Varna setup, individuals and groups were labelled and allocated a specific status by their rulers. The hierarchical constraints became set in stone, which further divided a nation and helped the British control the masses. But without question, the true victims of the social system have been the Dalits. They are seen to be so polluted that they are outside the Varna Jati system altogether. They are given the worst of jobs and denied the most basic of rights. Although the practice is constitutionally banned, the tragedy of discriminating the whole Dalit community is still at large. Many would like to simplistically write this off as a Hindu religious phenomena. But today the Vedic Yagna is not a mainstream Hindu practice. So the idea of trying to stay pure and avoid getting polluted is nonsensical. But unfortunately, narrow-minded ancient ideas have morphed into a contemporary cultural mindset. A mindset which has long been divorced from tradition and even abused by elite communities from different religions. So, there have been a number of positive and negative factors throughout history which have mixed together to create and sustain the Varna Jati system. Scripture stemming from the Rig Veda and the Gita outlined the nature of a well-ordered society geared towards the success of all, an order which was based on birth and quality. The corruption of a ritual obsessed Brahmin class combined with the ruling kings or imperial powers further entrenched the focus on birth ahead of qualities. The Dharmashastras provided so-called scriptural justification. Repeated invasions from foreign lands meant that the Indian society had to tighten rules of behaviour in order to protect their tradition. The British colonial agenda fixed and strengthened the borders between the groups. The different Jatis have provided much needed economic and cultural support for the individuals of the various groups. And finally, one has to note the political element. So-called anti-caste representatives call upon individual castes to unite and vote for them, which ironically strengthens the whole institution of caste. But the most anti-caste movements have come from the Hindus themselves. There have been countless personalities for millennia who have openly rebelled and defied caste barriers. Basava of the Shaiva Lingayat sect for example spoke aggressively against caste oppression and the obsession with ritual purity. He openly married Brahmins and Shudras breaking distinctions based on birth. During the medieval period we have a whole host of saints many of whom from the lower classes who broke free from any social boundaries. Dukaram, Tulsidas, Kabir, Nanak and many more all took strong stances against caste discrimination, 
arguing that one's humility and devotion was the only thing that made one worthy. In more modern times, we find masters such as Swami Vivekananda and persons such as Gandhi who called for the abolishing of untouchability and used Hindu philosophy to justify their stance. Going forward, one can see that the need of a hereditary Varna system is and has been for a while completely obsolete. The very nature of civilization from Vedic times is almost unrecognizable. We have machines and technology, industry and education and economics is within a globalized context. Varna from a practical perspective is irrelevant. Just as the goal of Krishna's teachings was Loka Sangraha, so too our goal must be the same. The practical and social implications of Varna must be abandoned. But the quality implications can still be useful. It would mean that instead of a subliminal caste system where the elite class is based on fame, power or wealth, it would be defined by those who are detached, humble and full of virtue. The stain of the Varnajati system has arisen due to the arrogant judgment of the lower classes, but such statements run in direct contradiction to Hindu thought. The universal Atman common to all life is the centerpiece of Hinduism. Krishna talks about Samadarshana, the even vision, where one sees a supreme divinity in every being. He states, The humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog-eater. Hinduism has whole teachings surrounding Ahimsa, where non-violence is about eliminating all harm in thought, word, and deed. The concept of sultram or purity is not associated with external religious ritual but with internal mastery of negativity. Therefore, there is no justification to disassociate with anyone based on their birth or work. But one should appreciate that entrenched social atrocities can take time to disappear. A free Christian America only abolished slavery in 1865 and finally ended black-white apartheid as late as 1954. India, however, only gained independence in 1947 after centuries of invasions and foreign rule dating back to the 11th century. The identity and transformation of the nation is a churning process which is ongoing. Hindus should not be afraid of challenging and reforming old social models. Unlike forms of Abrahamic religion, Hinduism is a spiritual culture that is always on the march. It is a living, breathing tradition. The eternal truths of the universe, the nature of reality and the self, are a constant. These truths do not divide the world into believer or non-believer, but in fact unite them under one supreme consciousness. Dharma, however, is not an eternal truth and is always under review depending on the social, economic and the political context. Scripture is a guide to Dharma along with the words of the master and indeed one's own personal revelation. Therefore, Hindus can and should have no anxiety in honestly confronting social issues head on. The overwhelming majority of Hindus have already abandoned any notion of caste. In the spirit of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the whole world being one family, increasingly we see that the tradition has been embraced by non-Indians. There are whole movements where those of a Western origin with no Varna or Jati background are taking up the tradition, performing puja, meditation techniques, mantra chanting and learning the philosophy. This in itself is overwhelming, emphatic evidence that caste is not integral to Hindu life. One can see that the universal tradition of Sanadana Dharma not only survives caste but flourishes without it. With this in mind, Hindus around the world should unite and work together to fight social injustice and strive to strengthen and spread this glorious tradition. Many thanks for listening.